So I am going to go through another example with you. So at the top of day six, our warm up for the day. So originally, this was another um, example, like the two I'd covered the um, doing a double heterozygous cross yesterday, I did two of them. So if you're like, but I need to know how to do this again. You could always go back to your notes up here. I did two of these for you in class yesterday. So we've already done um, crossing two parents that are heterozygous for two traits. So you have that in your notes. So I wanna change this warm up uh, one up a little bit and do one that might be kind of more similar to one you might've seen in your homework. So I'm going to make one of the parents homozygous recessive for shape. So homozygous recessive for shape. And remember, we're using an R to represent shape. So little r, little r. And then that parent is going to be heterozygous for color. So for yellow, they're going to be big Y, little y. That's one parent. The other parent, I'm still gonna make them heterozygous. So they're gonna be heterozygous for seed shape and heterozygous for seed color. So the first thing you need to do with these dihybrid crosses is you must get the parents' genotypes written down correctly. Otherwise, the next step, trying to figure out what possible gametes they could pass on to their offspring is really, really hard. Okay, so make sure you start there and you get that genotype written down first. And then we get to do the FOIL method. So remember the FOIL method means you're taking the first letter, which in our case is little r, and you're combining it with the first letter of the, the y's. So little r, big Y. So that's our first possible gamete that this parent can make. And remember, gamete means sperm or egg, right? That's what gamete is. That was, that's from the first day of this unit when we talked about how we get our genes. So when a parent is making gametes, it's basically they're, they're going through meiosis, making sperm or eggs. So when we're asking what are the possible gametes, we're asking what letters, what alleles will you find in those sperm and egg? All right. So little, little r can go with big Y or little r can go with little y. Okay, and then we have a second little r that can go with big Y or little r, little y. So there's always gonna be four possible gametes that can be made and you should always do the FOIL method to figure those out. So let's do that again over here with our heterozygous parent. And we'll start with big R, big Y. And then big R can go with little y. And then the little R can go with the big Y. And little R can go with the little y. So we have four different possible gametes in the, in the individual, the parent that's heterozygous for both. If you look over here, we actually only have two different ones, but we still make four. So still do all four of them um, when you're trying to set up your Punnett square because your Punnett square is gonna be a four by four. Okay. So knowing the parent's genotype, knowing how to FOIL to figure out their gametes, that is the first two steps. You must get those right first. Then you're gonna put one parent on the top. So I'm gonna put this parent on the top. Um, and by the way, this particular Punnett square um, has a box for you to put the gametes in normally. You don't have a box to put them in, but we do for this one. And then I'm gonna put my other parent on this side. Now, everyone keeps asking me, 
Miss Clapper, does it matter which parent goes on which side? It does not matter. As long as you keep their gametes for one parent on the same side, it doesn't matter if you put them along the top or along the side, just keep them together. So this parent made big little r big y or little r little y. All right, so now from here, we just fill in our Punnett square. And I think that most of you are understanding that part okay. It's just the setup that's getting people. So remember, we keep the same letters together. So we're gonna keep ours in front because they're written in front in our gametes. So let's just keep them first. Anytime you have a dominant and a recessive you of the same letter, you still write the dominant first before the recessive. And then you just go from there. And hopefully you are just filling these in as I'm filling in mine. All right, so once you have all the Punnett square filled in, I just want you all to recognize what it is that you've made here. So each of the um, each of the genotypes that I have here in red, those are all the babies. Okay, so the parents were the blue is representing the gametes, and after these gametes have joined together in fertilization, these are the possible offspring, the possible babies that could be made by this, this, these two parents. So now once you have it filled in, you can start answering questions about the offspring. So the first question is asking how many offspring will be recessive for both traits? So I'm not asking for a percentage here. I'm asking how many. So I just want a count. How many of the offspring are going to be recessive for both of uh, traits. So I see one down here and I see one right here. Two. There are two. The next question is asking how many of the offspring will be homozygous dominant for both traits? Zero. That would be a big old zero, right? Because homozygous dominant means big R, big R, big Y, big Y, and none of our babies have that genotype. All right, the last thing it's asking is what is the phenotype ratio of the offspring? So yesterday I went over the order that you are to count this up. So the first number is always the number of offspring that are dominant for both traits. So as long as the baby has a big R and a big Y, you would count them for this first number in the phenotype ratio. So I'm gonna start, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna use a different color. I'm gonna highlight in orange all my dominant, dominant babies. And I think that's it. So how many are there? Six. There are six. So that's the first number of our phenotype ratio. 
The next number is how many are dominant for the R, but they're recessive for the Y. So they have a big R, but they are homozygous recessive for white, or for, sorry, yellow, uh, green, I guess this is, the Y. So I'm gonna highlight these guys in blue. Oops, that's not a highlighter. Hello. So I have one here, I've got one here. Do I have any other ones? I don't see any other ones. So what's my second number? Uh, Miss Klepper? Yeah. For the first number, the six, how is that? Um, oh, wait. So you're counting up how many are dominant for both the round shape and the yellow color. So as long as they have the dominant R and, the, and one dominant Y, they're going to be dominant for both traits. Remember, we're doing, this is the phenotype ratio. So what they look like. Got it. Okay. So our second number is going to be two. Our third number is how many are recessive for R and dominant for Y. So we're counting up how many are recessive for R, but dominant for Y. So how many do you see? I count six. So they highlighted them in green. So this whole row, and then there's two in the last column um, that are, have their homozygous recessive for round for sh um, shape and they are dominant with the Y. All right, and then the last number is how many of the offspring would be recessive for both? So they are gonna be recessive R, homozygous recessive R and homozygous recessive Y. And those were the two that we counted here. So we have a six to two to six to two ratio for the phenotype ratio. So I'm hoping that that helped you with um, yesterday's homework and with yesterday's lesson. Um, if you are still struggling with how to set these up, with how to um, find the gametes. At the end of class today, we'll have some time for you to um, ask questions about that. All right, so moving on to today's topic, and this, this is not gonna take too long. Um, this isn't too challenging. So we're gonna go, we're gonna leave the dye hybrids for a little bit. So. If your brain is like, oh my gosh, this is hard. Dihybrids is really hard. We're going to take a little break from that. Okay. So today we're going to talk about different types of dominance. So up until now, we've only been learning about complete dominance. Okay. So every example I've given you up until now, up until today has been complete dominance. And that's when one allele completely dominates over another. So the heterozygous always shows up as the dominant phenotype. But this is not the only way that we see traits being inherited. So there's other types of dominance. So we're going to start off by talking about incomplete dominance. So in incomplete dominance, this is when neither form of an allele is dominant over the other, neither one. Instead, what you get is a blending of the two traits as a third completely different phenotype in the heterozygous individual. Okay, so let's talk about what this means. So let's take a look at these flowers here. We see this example of incomplete dominance happening in flowers and some in some animals. 
So we have a red version of a flower and I'm just gonna use um, big R, big R to represent the red, even though it's not dominant over the white. I'm just using the same letter because I because um, we're still talking about the same trait. Okay, we're still just talking about flower color. So if I use big R, big R to represent the red parent and little r, little r to represent the white version. When we cross these two in a Punnett square, what we find is the heterozygous babies are all pink. And this is a third phenotype. It's neither red nor white. It's somewhere in between. And I say somewhere in between because if you've ever played with paints before and you've taken white and red and you mix them together, you get pink. So if you've ever played with paints before, you would know that. Um, so what we notice is that um, in incomplete dominance, the heterozygous is, is a color that's in between or a, a, a trait that's in between the two. Okay, neither one of the, um, the other, the outside versions are dominant over the other. Another example, we can see this is in horses. So for all my horse lovers out there. So um, you, you can have, if you cross a cream colored horse, which is almost white with a dark brown horse, you get a third color in the heterozygous, which is called Palomino. It's a color in between the cream and the dark. And so over here, I have listed the genotypes. So again, I'm using Ds to represent um, the color of the horse, but the dark brown is not dominant over the cream color. It's just, these are two different versions. And then the heterozygous is the third color. So I have a little um, incomplete dominance humor here for you. So take a look at the cartoon. So this pink pig is telling this cow and chicken, hey, here's my mom and dad. So mom was red, dad was white, and the pig ended up being pink. So there's my incomplete dominance humor for you for today. All right, so let's practice this. So I have some examples here. Um, so just as a reminder, again, we have big R, big R is gonna represent our red flowers. The heterozygous is gonna be pink and little r, little r is gonna represent the white version. So before we get started, I wanna point out that there's a typo on here. Who sees the typo? Who's the first one to see it? Um, the red is marked as R, big R, small R. Yes, this is wrong. So make sure you change the first, this right here, this big R, little R, that would be a pink flower. So to fix this, let's make that other R a big R. I love using this example because um, it gives you the chart, but yeah, that's been a typo that's bugged me for years. So we're gonna cross a red flower with a white flower. And so how you do this is exactly how we've been doing Punnett squares for the last couple of days. So I'm gonna put my red parent on the top and write white on the side, but it doesn't matter where you put them. Okay, you can put white on the top and red on the side, it's okay. Um, as long as you keep their gametes on the right side together. And then you just fill in the Punnett square like you know how. So now we can answer some questions about the offspring, right? Because the offspring are the babies inside of the Punnett square here. So what percent of the offspring will be pink? 100%. Right, so remember each square in a two by two Punnett square represents 25%. So all four of these would, be, would end up being pink. All these flowers would be pink. So the next question that says, what percent would be red? 
it would be a big old zero, right? You can't get a red flower from crossing a red flower with a white flower. They all end up being pink in this incomplete dominance. Okay, now let's cross a pink flower with a pink flower and see what happens. So we're gonna put our parents gametes on the side and then make the babies. So using your chart above, what percentage of the offspring will be, will have white flowers? 25. That would be 25%, right? This little r, little r is gonna be white. What percentage will be pink? 50. 50%, yep. So we would have, these two would be pink. Little r, little r would be white and big R, big R would be red, right? So we'd have, th there are actually three different phenotypes that are, that are um, possible when you cross two pink flowers. All right, so this is incomplete dominance when the third, when the heterozygous has a third color. Now we're gonna move on to talk about something called co-dominance. So co, the prefix co means together. So if, I, if you have a co-worker, that's somebody that you work with. If you cohabitate with somebody, that's somebody you live with. If you cooperate with somebody, that means you're operating together with somebody. Usually that means you're working well together. So in co-dominance, instead of neither color being dominant, they share in dominance. So that means the both versions show up in the heterozygous. So let me give you an example of this. So here I have a white bull. I know this is a bull because of this part down here hanging down at the bottom. And let's say we cross this bull with this cow. And I know she's a cow because she has an udder. Their offspring then would have white and red hairs. This color down here is something we call roan. And if you look at it closely, it's not a pink cow. It's not somewhere between red and white. You see both white and red hairs. So this is an example of co-dominance sharing dominance in the heterozygous. So let's take another look at an example with flowers. So there's a type of flower called an inpatient and there is a red version and a white version. And when you cross the red and the white version, what you get in the heterozygous is a flower that has both, both sharing red and white petals. So this is not a pink flower. This flower is showing both red and white. So it is co-dominant, sharing dominance. We still use the same letter because we're still talking about the same trait. All right, so if you scroll down, there's my, the next example here is my very favorite I love, I can't wait to say this every year. So in some breeds of chicken, when you cross the white chicken with the black version chicken, you get in the heterozygous chicken, something called an ermineet, but what I like to call it is the checkered chicken. Checkered chicken is really fun to say. So if you are sitting in your room right now and wanna say something fun, you should say checkered chicken. And what the ermineet checkered chicken has, if you look at it closely, is both white and black feathers. Okay, it's sharing dominance in the heterozygous. It's not a gray chicken, 
somewhere between white and black, it is both black and white at the same time. All right, so if we want to look at these two side by side to notice the difference. So in co-dominance, they share dominance in the heterozygous. So there's a red version and a white version and the heterozygous shares, they both show up in the heterozygous. In the incomplete dominance, if you cross red and white, you get a pink flower, a third color, a third phenotype, a blend of the two. So you will, be, you will need to be able to distinguish between these two um, on the test. There'll be a question about, is this an example of co-dominance or incomplete dominance? Um, so the homework assignment is, is set up to kind of help you get acquainted with both of those. But before we do that, let's do a co-dominance example together. So here we have my white and black and checkered chicken. So this feather color is being controlled by co-dominance. So if we use big B, big B to represent the black chicken and then little b, little b to represent the white chicken and then the heterozygous is big B, little b. So if I ask you, what is the genotype for the black chicken? What would you write? BB, like capital B, capital B. Yep, so make sure you say the size, big B, big B, right? So remember the word genotype is one of your vocab words and it just means what alleles do they have, right? All right, what is the genotype for the white chicken then? Little B, little B. Little B, little B. And then my checkered chicken, also known as ermineit. Big B, little B. Yep. All right, so we're going to cross two ermineite chickens. So remember what that means is that your parents are both going to be heterozygous. This is what we mean when we say cross. We're going to cross them and see what kind of babies they could have. So we're going to put each allele for the gametes on our Punnett square and then fill it in. All right, so if these two chickens had chicks, what percent chance would they have of having a black chick? 25. 25% right? This one right here would be our black chick. And then what percent chance do they have of having a white chick? 25. Also 25%, right? This one down here would be white. And then these two would be our checkered where there'd be black and white feathers, the two heterozygous. All right, so that's all I have for you today. Your homework consists of three pages. 